Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your kingdom. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sins Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the kingdom of God. My name is Scott Brooks. I'm the lead pastor on the preaching team, and um, you'll see me, Brad Larson, and many others uh, at the Louisville campus that, that preach Christ. And so what we do is we gather under the Word of God, we point to Jesus, and as we look at Christ, we become like Him, and He is, he is the hope. And so we have a, a preaching team <clears throat> here at the Door Church, and that kind of transitions. We are one church in two locations, and so uh, that's a little bit different than what most people think. It's not satellite. It's, it is uh, one church. We have the same mission to see lives restored with the gospel for God's glory. Like I said, we love to make much of Jesus, uh, and we believe we're better together. So we use our DNA of gospel-centered, community-driven, other people focus a team to to execute uh, this, this, this mission of the Door Church to, to reach people, to help grow people, to send them out. Uh, it's, it's a a big part of what we do at the Door Church. We want to magnify Christ uh, through maturing and multiplying. That's why we're one church, two location, and two locations. And we're making an announcement this morning uh, that Paul Mills, which be behind me, be big Paul Mills because we have a big screen. Paul Mills is going to be the Louisville campus pastor. So uh, we're going to give a big, yeah, that's a big deal. Um, so Paul Mills uh, has been an elder for over a year. He's been an elder uh, pastoring for, for many years, uh, although not, not paid. Um, and Drayton Shanks, if you know him, was the Louisville campus pastor uh, and has been at the Door Church for, uh, for a long time. Since the conception, God saved him 11 years ago, and he was baptized at the door and raised him up to be a student minister. And then, uh, then he became a campus pastor, and he felt called away uh, at the beginning of the year. He's still an elder. So an elder is a pastor of the church. He just doesn't get paid. So we get the best of both worlds. We get Drayton Shanks, but we don't have to pay him. Um, but that left a gap uh, in the Louisville campus in particular uh, to shepherd uh, really the sheep among among that Louisville campus. And so we have a great team there. Mark McPherson and the elders have been doing a great job of caring for, for uh, the flock there. Yet there has been a hole and uh, Paul has been praying and God laid it on his heart to say, hey, I want to to apply for this Louisville campus pastor position. It's one we've been looking for a while, and we hadn't found the right person. We're just not going to put someone in there. They'd be qualified. This is a big position, and through a lot of prayer, uh, he, he's our guy, and we couldn't be more excited that he's going to be on staff, and he's not going to be up up preaching a ton. He'll preach some. Uh, he can preach, but his his biggest job is going to be being helping really shepherd the Louisville flock uh, and, and teaching Bible studies and th- things like that. And we could not be more excited about uh, Paul Mills joining our team. He's been an elder, like I said, for a while, but wanted to let you guys uh, know about that. So we're continuing on in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, if you have your Bible, grab it. I'm going to read Matthew 6. I'm actually going to start in verse 5 today and go all the way through 13. Matthew 6, I'm going to read 5 through 13. Uh, the Lord's Prayer is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus are, is teaching the best sermon ever. And then he's going to teach us how to pray to God as our Father. I mean, this is very uh, instructive. This is very insightful. It's very helpful. And so Jesus is teaching us how to communicate with God as our Father. And it is, it is beautiful. This is the last installment of this series. So if you, if you haven't been here, we're just going verse by fir- uh, verse, looking at the Lord's Prayer uh, is, is really been beneficial, I know, for me and, and hopefully by God's grace for you. We'll pick up uh, in, in verse, verse 5, the Lord's Prayer. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues at the street corners that, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received the reward. I'm, I'm going to just stop and just talk about that just for a second. Usually I just read through the whole thing, but a lot of people think prayer is that. It's like we think there's a religious kind of rigmarole, like, hey, I've done it. I pray at my meal. I pray where people can see me. Uh, And really, you're not doing it for God. 
You're not, you're not trying to speak to God. You're not trying to set your mind on God. You just want to be perceived by others as religious. And this is a religious game that happens all the time, particularly in, in the Bible Belt uh, and others. We want to look self-righteous. That's not, <laughs> that's not clinging to Christ. That's a perception of you want other people to think highly of you. And Jesus says, don't do that. <laughs> you know, don't pray like that. He's, it, it's almost like if you're going to do that, just don't pray because you're doing it for yourself. And then it goes on to say, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. Pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. We're going to talk about the benefits uh, of that more uh, as we get to verse 13. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases. So again, Jesus is saying, don't, don't do this. Don't be a hypocrite. And don't be like the Gentiles. They heap up empty phrases. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So the idea there is don't, don't, don't treat, uh, treat God like a, a slot machine. You don't have to get the right combination to get the gifts to come out. Don't treat him like that. There's not magic words or formulas to get God indebted to you. But then Jesus, in a beautiful, instructive, insightful way, says, no, I want you to pray like this. He says, don't do this. This is deconstructive. Now he's going to reconstruct. I want you to pray like this. Pray then like this. Listen, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, we're going to talk about verse 13, the phantom verse that's there, not there. Because a lot of you, maybe in your mind, said, well, where's, for thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever, amen. Right? That's where that, that usually goes. But if you have the ESV, it's not there. If you have the NIV, it's not there. If you have the NASB, probably not there. Is that or is that not in, in Scripture? And what I'm going to say is I don't know. Uh, but what I do know is we're preaching on that this morning. Uh, we're preaching on the phantom verse of four, uh, verse 13. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Um, that is found in the King James Version. That is found in the New King, uh, New, New King James Version. Um, see, the reason why it's not in some of our modern manuscripts um, is because it's not always in the oldest manuscripts that are found uh, of, of the scriptures, uh, but it's found in many ancient Greek manuscripts, and I'm not going to argue. I'm not that. I'm, I'm just not that guy. Uh, but what I can say, uh, it's very biblical. Whether it's in the Bible or not, it's very biblical, and we should we should read it. We should know it. We should treasure it. And by God's grace, if you can really hear what God's saying, it will change your life this morning. I needed it this morning because I need my life changed every morning by who God is, regardless if it's in the text. Man, it is a beautiful beautiful truth. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So that's the sermon title. The reason why I feel so confident is just basically it's recapping the Lord's Prayer, but elsewhere in Scripture, as David is gathering up offerings for the temple, uh, he prays a very similar prayer. This is a doxology. That's a fun, fun word, to worship God. So at the end of the prayer, Jesus is saying, man, worship God for who he is, because that's the most important thing. If you're going to be changed by God this morning, you need to worship God. You got to worship him because as you worship him, as you praise him, it actually shapes you. It changes you in moments to be more like him. So first Chronicles 29, 11 through 13, a lot of people think this is where this, this scripture comes from, or this illusion. David prays this as they gather uh, offerings for the temple. It says, yours, O Lord, listen, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. You, uh, you are exalted uh, as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you and your rule over all. In your, ha in your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. So that, that, if you're listening, that has a lot of the words, man, thine is the kingdom, that power, the glory forever, amen. This is biblical and it's true and it should shape us. So Jesus, again, is teaching us how to pray to God, to speak to God. Um, if you haven't been here, there's really um, six different things, petitions, those are asks um, uh, that, that Jesus is telling us. He's asking for us to really see uh, his hallowness. He, he's a, 
to see his glory, uh, to see his kingdom, his will be done. So it's all about this is who God is. We wanna, we're asking for us to experience the beauty, the glory, the power of God in the first few verses of the prayer. And then it moves on to our good. God, please provide for us our daily bread. Please forgive us. We need you to bring forgiveness into our life. We need you to protect us from temptation. So he prays, man, uh, help us see your glory and then please provide for us. And then it ends, it ends with like, hey, get your eyes back on God. So it starts with God's glory, then it gets into our, our needs, our, our good, and then we need to get our eyes back on God's glory and praise who he is, because more, more than anything, than your circumstance, your needs, you need to understand who God is. This is actually the power of prayer. The power of prayer is actually not you getting everything you want. The power of prayer is beholding the glory of God. It changes everything. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a verse that's pretty quoted uh, about about anxiety and 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 just overwhelmness and um, and and just Philippians four verse four through seven. Let's just read that. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say what rejoice. Let your reasonless be known to ever in the Lord. The Lord is at hand. So let's get our eyes on God. Do not be anxious about anything. So what does it say? Do, should, should you be anxious about anything? It says no. Why? Because the Lord is at hand now. If I had to do a straw poll in here, who's anxious? Everyone is anxious. Everyone is overwhelmed. Everyone is confused to some degree. Why? Because they're not. Their eyes aren't on the Lord. <laughs> so, like, does a prayer work? No. When prayer works, the problem is you're not looking at the Lord. You're looking at your circumstance. You got to get your eyes off your circumstances onto the Lord. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And what? If you let your request be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So here's my big idea that I want to finish with this, this tagline, for thine is the kingdom, the power for glory forever. I know right now <laughs> the world is overwhelmed. I know right now you have a great deal of anxiety. I know right now <laughs> there's tons of confusion. And and rightfully so. <laughs> I mean, what I'm going to say is like, oh, you shouldn't feel that way. Well, I think you should. Your feelings matter. And number two, you have some probably some big things going on in your life that those are driving your feel- feelings. And for me to say is like, well, that's not a big deal. is just not kind nor true because it is a big deal and it's driving your anxiety. What I'm going to say is we have a bigger God. We have a big God theology. We got to see the glory of God behind our circumstance. As you see God, who he is, you know what happened? The peace of God will start to reign in your hearts and minds. So what I'm, what I'm not saying is your circumstances are always going to change. What I'm going to say is your perspective changes. And as your perspective changes, man, you have a peace. There's a confidence in God and not in this world. And that's what prayer is mostly about. Let's look at God. Let's look at who he is. And we can walk today, whatever it may be. And I'll give you some, some examples of that uh, from, from for thine is the kingdom. Of the, uh, and the power and the glory forever. So I'm going to outline those, this verse in three different little areas. One, where it says, for thine is the kingdom. I mean, this is, it's so good because it's just like, man, it's not about you. <laughs> for who, whose is this? It's, it's God's kingdom, not yours. It's his power, not yours. It's his glory, not yours. Forever means forever. Amen. Um, and so we're going to look at and break this down in three different ways. We should have a kingdom confidence uh, we should understand our powerful position, and then we should look at glorious grace. So I'm going to repeat that, and it just comes straight from the text. We should look at, we should have a kingdom com- a confidence. We should have a, uh, understand our powerful position, and then three, look at uh, God's glorious grace. So let's look at the first, the kingdom. For thine is the kingdom, uh, a kingdom confidence. So uh, it, what it's telling us, as you're praying, that God is king. What does that mean, God is king? He is the one who controls everything. This is like, whether you believe it or not, everything in your life has been governed by God. He is sovereign over everything, right? So when we say that, that he is the king, that he is, he is the center, he, his rule and reign extends of all places, of all times, including your life, a kingdom confidence, 
There is a king and and is God. He controls everything. Psalm uh, 93, 1 through 5 states it this way. The Lord, what reigns? God reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength on his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from old. It's always been this way. You are from everlasting The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters, mightier than the waves of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness uh, befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. The big idea, God reigns. So as we close your prayer, as Jesus is teaching us, he wants you to remember the king of kings. God reigns over everything. Psalm 47 verse 8 says it this way, God reigns over the nations, ours included, whatever politics at hand. Who sits over that? God reigns over all the nations. God sits on his holy throne. This is true. The question, are we seeing it as true? So the question as we finish are praying, who is ruling and raising, uh, reigning? God. You know how comforting that is? No one's going to knock him off his throne. No matter what circumstance happens in your life today, God, God is God, and that's a great thing. Now, my hope and prayer is, it's capital T truth. That means it's not changing whether you believe it or not. My hope is that you would experience and believe this this morning. Um, I hope... I hope we have a Lion King moment. And here's what I was thinking. Mufasa, if you've seen the Lion King, he's the king, right? And he brings his son, Simba. And he says, everything the light touches is our kingdom. Right? So you have this king telling his son, everything that you see, this is ours. You know what Simba's response is? Wow. Wow. That's subjective response. His breath is taken away. This, this is all... This is ours? Why? Because he's experiencing that truth. Now, this is very insightful if we're going to have this speak to our hearts this morning is to have a Lion King moment. This is not an antelope moment. Simba's the son. You know what I'm saying? He didn't, he didn't get the antelope and say, hey, antelope, come here. Let's look at all the kingdom. That's mine. The antelope would be like, well, that's very impressive, Mufasa. Well, that's very good for you. That's impressive, Right? You wouldn't have the same response unless what? You, you had a relationship. Relationship changes everything. What, what, what Jesus is saying, our Father's in heaven. That's an invitation of relationship to that, that king to be your dad. Now, that should make you say, wow. Wow. Now, a lot of us, we have this idea Without relationship, we say, well, yeah, God's God. He's king. I, everything you said, I believe. I just read scripture. That seems to be true. You're here, so some degree you believe that's true, but you're not really experiencing it, it's true. And here, here's maybe why. Because you don't see the relationship that Jesus wants to afford, afford you in his life for your life. What you do is come to him not on a, a, a son a son-dad relationship, you come to him on a contingent relationship. A lot of us believe this. We think that, yes, God is, he is the king, but I got to manipulate this king so he doesn't zap me, right? If I, if I, not, if I don't do good enough, the king's going to kill me. See, this is a condi- conditional idea of, of really Christianity, but this is the idea of, a lot of us believe about God, if I obey God, if I, if I do enough, if I keep the Ten Commandments, if I give, if I, if I quit doing this habit, if I, if, I, if, I, if I do these things, God will love me. That is a false gospel. You're not coming to him on a, a son-father a, 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 a son relationship. You're coming to him on a, on a, a, on a merit. And he, it's more wicked than you could think. Why? Because you think somehow that you can move in such a way in your own accord to put God in your debt. You're like, well, no, no, that's not what I'm saying. No, that's exactly what you're saying. Because if I can do certain things to earn his favor, well, I deserve it, and I have demands before a king of kings. So here's 
what this looks like. If you can say, if I keep the Ten Commandments, I go to this Bible study, if I share my faith enough, I do this stuff, God, I get my life. That's a false gospel, and you are going to have an unhealthy relationship with God, and it's frankly unbiblical. One, your life may be going really well right now because of the things that you're doing, and you know what you're going to do? You're going to have a very proud, for, proud heart. It's like, well, I'm doing pretty well because I don't miss church. I'm doing pretty well because I'm pretty self, self-controlled. I read my Bible, and I've done such a good job. God's just, he's blessing me. And you're like, look how great I am. Was that a very gracious spirit? No. Are you going to be compassionate to other people that are struggling? No. You're like, you should just be like me. That, that, that aids to an arrogance that's certainly not biblical. The other one that we see all the time that you come on, if I'm good enough, God will love me, is anger. Because maybe you, you, you're a good, maybe you're a good person for whatever that means. Like you, you, you come to church, you've done a good job with your kids, you don't cheat on your wife, you pay your bills. Like I'm a good person, but you're left with anger and bitterness because you have unmet expectations that you said, God, you owe me. You owe me wealth. You owe me my health. You owe me because I did these things. That's not, that's not how the relationship with God works as a father. You're trying to put him in your debt. And there's another one. So you're going to be proud if this is the way you come to God. You're going to be angered and embittered, or you're going to feel absolutely guilty. Because some of you are like, you, you know you're not good enough. You're like, well, the reason why my life stinks is because I'm a stinky person. Then that, again, is a false gospel, right? Because you think God's after you because you haven't held up your end of the bargain. This is not how we relate to God as our king. We come, we come on the basis of, of Jesus' invitation that God can be your father. How can Jesus say that? Because Jesus is offering you his relationship that he's always had with God as his father. We come to him in reverence and respect. He's the king of kings. He's always been, he rules and he reigns, but we come, if we come in Christ, if we don't, he's he's not our father, but we come in Christ. The creator of everything and everyone is your father. See, Jesus in the Lord's prayer, it's an invitation to know that God is your dad. It's a really intimate thing. In John, uh, John 1, verses 12 and 13, here's the invitation. But all who did receive him, who believed what in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. It's a powerful invitation. The Lord's Prayer is just echoing this invitation. Who believed in his name? What does that mean? That Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose again. It's his righteousness, not yours. He has paid the debt that you couldn't pay. The reason why you can have a relationship with God as a sinner alone is through the precious work of Jesus Christ. If you believe in what his name, do you believe that? And in his name, you now have a right. You have a privilege to be called children of God. That, um, that, that's beautiful. Um, that means when you come to Christ, God hears you, and he loves you, and he knows you and responds to you. God has an attentive ear towards you. I, I, you know you know who has that with me? My family. To some degree, if you're a part of the church family, you have that. If you send me an email, I'm going to respond. If you want to meet, I'm going to try to meet with you. We have a relationship, and it's my, it's my duty to do that, and I, and I desire that. You know who has a greater relationship with me than anyone is <laughs> my kids. If my, my kids call me twice, I'm stepping out of any meeting. You know why? I want to make sure they're okay. Why? Because they're my kids. They have my ear. Kate can call me in the middle of the night at 3 a.m. and say, Daddy, I want some water. You know who's getting out of bed? Dad's getting out of water or getting out of bed to get her some water. Why? She has my ear. This is the point of having a relationship with God is that he, you have his ear. He hears you. Now, this is, this is powerful uh, when you understand the access that, that Jesus is inviting us into, not only is he the king, but the king is your dad. And then we'll go into the, the, the powerful position to be a son and daughter, the powerful position. So what that means, and it, it's similar, for thine is the kingdom, the power. It's like to see the power, the wisdom of God is what you need more of anything. I, I know right now some of you are like, Scott, I got a laundry list. Of things I need. And what I'm going to tell you is what you need more than anything is to see, to see who God is. Um, so our position is to sit under 
a powerful, loving God. That's our position. So it's like powerful, like, I can do what I want. No, powerful position is that you get to sit under, you get to sit under, man, God as your father. Now, let's talk about, let's talk about who God is. If that's true, that's what we need more than anything. Let's talk about who he is. In Genesis 1-1, first scripture, first scripture in the Bible. So Genesis is the book of the beginnings. In the beginning, so that's before anything's ever made. In the beginning, were you there? No. Were you ever thought of? You know, were you thinking of yourself? No. In the beginning was what? God created the heavens and the earth. Who was in the beginning? God. This is big God theology. God was in the beginning. You were not. Your kids weren't. (laughs) Whatever you think has always been wasn't. In the beginning, God. And then he created. You know what that means? There is a creator and we are creation. There is a constant, which is God, and we are dependent. That's a good position to be in. Know why? Because we can't create life. We can't sustain life. We can't control life. We are not powerful, but who is God? And so we can be dependent on God. It is a blessed position to understand your dependency. It is a blessed position to understand your dependency on all-powerful God. And it's always been that way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Man, that's a big God theology. Furthermore, Psalm 115 verse 3 says it this way. Our God is in the heavens. Now, what does he do? What does he do? Whatever he pleases. Does he need your permission? No. No, what he created. The creator does whatever he wants, whenever he wants. Now, this can be a scary thing if you don't know the nature of God. God does what? Whatever he pleases. And listen, he is only good. So God is good, right? So that's his character. So he can only do good. To do something else is impossible for God. Why? Because he is good and he is able to do whatever he pleases. So God always does good. Like if you look at creation, you see power and wisdom and beauty. Why? Because that's a representation of God and who he is. It says in Isaiah, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and the whole earth is what filled with his glory. It's a display of his power, his glory, his goodness. Now, this is, again, capital T, truth, objective. Subjective truth is that we need to have our hearts centered on how much God loves you. So I was just watching Tombstone. A guy walks out, and he had pretty good theology, not at the end, but the the beginning. He's like, man, look at the stars. He's like, man, you ever thought about God and all the stars that he made? And then that then he made me, and that's flattering. That's that's really actually amazing theology. Go go look at the stars and the creation, and then think like, and I'm gonna make you. You should be flattered and overwhelmed by that particular particularity. Psalm one thirty nine seventeen and eighteen says it this way: How precious to me are your thoughts, O God! Listen, <laughs> how vast is the sum of them? If I were to count them, they are more than the sand. I wake and I'm still with you. What that just said is God thinks of you more than all the sand and all the seashores and all the world. And when you wake, there's more. So the, the power, the goodness of God is not just abstract, it's particular. And it's set on you in a very particular way. He's, he's always thinking of you. It says in places in Scripture, you are the apple of his eye when you're in Jesus Christ. Um. It's not going to be on the screen, but Luke 12, 7, which I always love, is, man, he knows the numbers of head, uh, n- number of hairs on your head, which is always more impressive for some than others. But nonetheless, that's very, very particular, that he is very intimately acquainted with you. This powerful God, yes, is out there. He's transcendent, but it's very intimate, and it's powerful if you see the potency on your life. Now, you're like, Scott, great created everything, creates me, thinks about me a lot. Well, I got a lot of problems going on in my life. I don't see how this translates. Well, I'll tell you how. Job, Job is a great uh, illustration for this. If you don't know the book of Job, go read it. It's very long, but it's it's still very good. In the beginning, Job was a righteous man, and Job lost everything. God, under God's sovereignty, God lost, or Job lost everything. He lost his wealth in a blink of eye. All his donkeys, sheep, oxen, gone. He lost, he lost his kids. That's his family. He lost his kids. We read this as like, oh, you know, that guy in the Bible lost his kids. No, he lost his kids. 
Think about your kids. He lost his kids. He lost his health. You know, you know what Job needed more than anything? It was a big God theology. You know what he did as he lost everything in Job 1, 20 and 21? He said this, then Job, after he lost everything, arose, tore his clothes, tore his robe. Well, I didn't say you got to be happy about it. And he was like, man, this is what I wanted. No, he tore his robe, shaved his head, and fell on the ground, and he worshiped. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So he lost everything, and he worshiped God. Now, if you read the book on, he struggles. He's like, man, I don't, he, you know, why is this happening? I'd like to know. You know what? God never gives an answer why. A lot of people have lots of questions of the circumstances happening in your life. Why, why, why? God doesn't answer the why, just so you know. Sometimes he does. Job never gets an answer of, of the why. But what, what, what happens here is, is God shows him who he is, and that's enough. In, in Job 38, 4 through 6, and actually does it in 38 and 39, it's really beautiful. I'm going to pick out a snippet. It says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? So he's lost his health. He's lost his kids. He's lost his wealth. He goes, and where were you when I created the earth with power and wisdom? Who determined its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? Uh, on, on what were its bases sunk or who laid its cornerstone? The big idea is like, I created everything. I sustain everything. You see the wisdom, the power, the might. I still have that. This is who I am. And when Job heard who God is as he revealed himself to Job. You know what Job says in 42 verse 5 as he's struggling? He says, I, I had heard of you by the hearing of my ear. See, a lot of us have heard about God's goodness. We hear about the power of God. But then what happened? He says, but now my eyes see you. Now, now, now I'm, I'm tasting and seeing your goodness. That's what we need this morning is to experience the goodness of God. Not because so many times like, oh, I know this. If it's not changing you, what I'm going to say is you don't know it. You're not seeing it. It's not, it's not transforming you. You still think your circumstance, your problem. And I'm going to repeat what the Bible says, what the Lord's prayer says, what Job says. That's not your problem. You're not seeing God. You're not seeing God. And here's how this, this translates is God's arm is not shortened to save. That's Isaiah 59, 1. So you may be looking at your circumstance like, what good can come from this? Is like What I'd say is God's hand is not shortened that he's not going to do something with it. You may not see it, but he is. And you may not get the why, but you got to understand this is character in nature. His his hand is not shortened to save. He can do things that we cannot do. He thinks things that we do not think. And the, the, the center of Christian theology is the cross of Christ. No one looked at the cross of Christ on Fridays like, that's a good idea. But on Sundays, like, yes. Why? Because resurrection happened. See, our God is in the, is in the business of salvation, of redemption, of forgiveness, of mercy. The cross of the Christ, the cross of Christ is proof of that, not only for redemption of our souls, but for our worlds and the whole creation as he returns. It says this idea is God is in the business of resurrection. You, 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 need, you need to ponder that idea. That God is in the business of resurrection. What does that mean? Making dead things alive. What you think is dead, he makes alive. That's why your circumstance is not your biggest problem. Because right? your biggest problem is not death. Why? Because Jesus defeated death. He's in the business of what? Resurrection and redemption. His hand is not too short to save. See, salvation is not something in the Christian faith. Jesus is not something in the Christian faith. It's everything in the Christian faith. Until you get that, you're going to think God's betraying you. And I'm going to say you don't understand Christianity. Jesus is everything. Salvation is everything. Redemption is everything. Restoration is everything. Why? Because Job says, I don't have anything anymore, but you're enough. There's going to be a time when you're alive and you're like, I don't have anything anymore. And you're going to have to figure out, is Jesus enough? And he is. He is. It's only a matter of time. You've got to look to the character of God and the cross of Christ. He's like, my God is in the business of resurrection. 
this is what we believe as Christians. And this is what we're training our minds in in the Lord's Prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power to make dead things alive. And I'll, I'll, I'll close quickly on this. For, the, uh, for his glory forever, amen. So glorious grace. We are, we, we are, our biggest problem is glory-hungry fools. What does that mean? Is we try to look for life in creation, not the creator. And that leads to death. There is, no, there is no life apart from God, but we like to believe there is. And there is not. And so we are glory-hungry. We, we desire glory. Like we want to steal God's glory and try to get life apart from God. Impossible. We are glory deficient. I don't care how much money you have, how beautiful you are, how awesome your kids are, is not going to sustain. It's not. Glory deficient. See, the truth about Christianity is we're dependent. We are desperate. We are hopeless apart from the grace of God. If you believe something else, you're not here in Christianity. We are glory deficient. So as we, as we get to the end, it's, it's about the glory of God forever. Amen. That is the most beautiful truth that you could ever wrap, wrap your head around in Scripture. One thing we say at the church a lot on the internal level, a lot, it's not about you. It's not about you. Every time you, every time you wake up, you understand it's not about you. This is God's story. You're in it. Jesus is the hero, and thank God he's going to save you if your faith is in him. It's not about you. So that seems maybe like a really bad thing, but that's a glorious thing. Why? Because he's the one who can save. He's the one who can redeem. He's the one that can make dead things alive. See, it's not about you. Every time we end that prayer, man, God be the glory. He's the one who can save. I'm going to read Psalm 115, 9, and I'll, and I'll close in prayer. Uh, 1 through 9. Listen. Jesus is not something, he's everything. It says in Colossians 2, uh, 3.11, Christ is all. It's everything. Now listen, as we think about, man, to Christ be the glory. Why? Because he's the one who can save or redeem. Nothing in this world will last. Listen to verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory. That, that's our mantra. Not, not to us, but to you, for the sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness. Why? Be, and, <laughs> This is Old Testament. Because of Christ, because of his steadfast love and his faithfulness, his redemption, to you be the glory. Verse 2, why should the nation say, where is their God? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Listen to the, the, the counterpart. If you're, not, if you're not giving God glory, you're trying to get glory in creation. Listen to the trajectory of the, the, the life. If you're not giving God glory, if we're not reminding ourselves in prayer, the idols are silver and gold. The work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. Eyes, but do not see. They have ears, but do not hear. Noses, but do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. Those who hope in idols become like them. Dumb, deaf, and dead. So do all who trust in them. But verse 9, O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. See, to God be the glory and what Jesus has done for us, his life for our life. He is not something, he is everything. And when you end that way, no matter what's going on in your, in your life circumstantially, you're going to walk with a God confidence, a God swagger. Jesus, Jesus is king. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is powerful. Jesus to be the glory. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would help us respond in faith. God, there's so many things in our life that we put our hope in that are simple, simply creation, created things. Maybe it's our business, maybe it's our relationships, maybe it can be anything. Any good gift we can make into an idol and it's gonna lead us to becoming deaf and mute and dead. Only Christ makes alive. Only Christ makes alive. I pray that as we pray, for thine is the kingdom, the glory, and power forever, that we would just be moved by your spirit to treasure Jesus more, to understand that salvation is our only hope and that our hope would be found in Christ alone. I ask that in Jesus' powerful name, amen.